how do you feel this recognition uh, you know and does it impact your career or and serve as a beacon of inspiration for fellow music there, there are many good bands in india that do alternative rock but Uh, it's not on the same scale as in the west i think if i was uh, outside like in the west i think the award would have had more of an impact and i think i would have had more opportunities amazing your song white bone you know tackles the issues of ivory poaching which really is a serious concern you know combining music with powerful visuals to raise awareness i have always been environmentally conscious still am and uh, quite sad about how things are going right now in terms of the world stage climate change and all of that do you believe that musicians can harness technology to push the boundaries of their artistry this is a bit of a touchy subject because uh, ever since keyboards came into the picture where programming was possible and sampling was possible a lot of musicians actually lost their jobs but what what happens to these musicians when their use is over you know i'm sorry to say this but the government doesn't care about them one bit at all so i was saying this is not okay you can't just you know use them when they are at their prime and then kind of you know just forget about them or neglect them when they are no longer you know able to present hi welcome to the mohua show My name is Mohua Chinappa and I am an author, entrepreneur and ex-housewife. This podcast is about everything from business to technology to arts to lifestyle but done and spoken imandari se. Hi, in today's episode we have with us Nisia Mujoli, founder trustee of the Mujoli Music Trust. She is a semi-retired western classical concert pianist, singer, songwriter, teacher, conductor and composer who that i had to say in one breath <laughs> with several music and film awards for the majoli project nisia has had her musical education brunei and singapore and went on to do her degree in music from the western australian conservatorium in perth nisia was also the founder president of the nisia majoli center for performing arts and creator of the alternative rock the majoli project She's empaneled in the Indian Council of Cultural Relations Reference Panel of Artists and also an advisory council member of the Karnataka Artists Association. Recently, Nisia has also won the gold prize for composition at the World Classical Music Awards, which is amazing journey, Nisia. Wow, what an honor for me to have you with me today. I love music, and I think there isn't a human being on earth who won't like music or love music so welcome in today's show you know with such a multifaceted career uh, with such a multifaceted career how do you manage to juggle between teaching performing composing and running the majoli music trust so do you have any specific uh, strategies or routines that uh, you know that help you maintain the balance and the focus because it isn't easy to wear so many hats all together first of all thank you for inviting me on the show so i truly appreciate it uh so to answer your question i think uh, it's a matter of being organized because uh, if you plan your day well enough and understand what needs to be done in that particular day i think you can get a lot done and uh, possibly uh, this also stems from childhood because my late father was a very strict disciplinarian and uh, made sure that i set aside time for various things including practicing the piano of course so and uh, i was myself a pretty disciplined child i never needed to be nagged to do my homework or stuff like that so i think all that has kind of carried on into my college days and into my adulthood so yes there are a lot of things to juggle but i think if you break down the tasks and organize them well into a day uh, you will be able to manage a lot of things actually so the idea here is not to waste too much time on unnecessary things but to get the job done and still find some time to relax at the end of the day wow i can't imagine how you would do that but well i think for all our listeners we have a lot to learn from you here so alternative rock and ivory poaching you've been awarded alternative artist of the year at the international music and entertainment awards association imea for the alternative rock song fenced circle being the first indian act to win this prestigious award must be in 
incredibly empowering. How do you feel this recognition, uh, you know, and does it impact your career or and serve as a beacon of inspiration for fellow music, fellow female musicians in India and beyond? I mean, I hate to use the word female musicians and female doctor and female lawyer and the rest of it. But I think at the end of the day, um, it still matters because there are few women you know, who are out there getting the awards, getting recognition uh, easier than what, uh, you know, um, a fellow male artist or, you know, another professional has got. And we can't deny that. So tell me a little about it, Nisia. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know whether it's a fortunate or unfortunate thing, but I've always set my own path regardless. Uh, and I have uh, written music, uh, what I feel is important to talk about. Uh, yes, it was wonderful to win the award as uh, probably the first Indian to do so. Uh, but, you know, unfortunately, I think in India, the market for Western music, I mean, alternative rock also. I mean, there, there are many good bands in India that do alternative rock, but uh, it's not on the same scale as in the West. I think if I was uh, outside, like in the West, I think the award would have had more of an impact and I think I would have had more opportunities. So it's not very easy in India to kind of uh, push through, you know, with the music uh, that I have been doing. Uh, also, just to clarify, I was trained as a Western classical musician, of course, but um, uh, and I still do it. But uh, even from a young age, I wanted to be a, a rock star. So a little bit later on in my adult life, I thought, okay, I, I have this ability to write songs, so why not? And so I started writing from 1993, in fact, and uh, was able to release an album, fortunately, and which has uh, garnered the appreciation of my peers, which is wonderful. Uh, it may not be like so famous in terms of mass, uh, you know, mass appreciation, but I'm not really bothered about that because if my peers love what I do, then that's important. But I, I don't think, I mean, I wish it could have made more of an impact, but I don't think it actually has, maybe because of where I am and, you know, how how the music scene in India is generally in terms of, yeah, rock or classical or whatever it is. So I just, I just did what I had to do. So <laughs> Yeah, but it's amazing. I mean, you know, it, 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 it is amazing what you've achieved. And I was reading your bio when I received it. I said, oh, my God, I was intimidated. And I said goodness you know uh wow but you know it's talking to you you're so collected and you know all together so you make me feel so comfortable doing this podcast and um yes so it's amazing your song white bone you know tackles the issues of ivory poaching which really is a serious concern you know combining music with powerful visuals to raise awareness uh how do you see the role of musicians in addressing social and environmental issues and yes ivory poaching is a is a huge reality and I think there have been a few films now uh, also that's won a great award and uh, there have been films on, on on these things but I've not heard of a song you know where uh, uh, we have spoken about these issues so just tell me a little bit about it yeah sure so uh, when I was a music degree student in Perth uh, what I really appreciated about Australia in general was they were always very environmentally conscious uh, and I learned a lot about uh, uh, environmentally friendly practices when I was in Australia that I was not aware of when I was in Singapore before that or even in Dubai where I was born and brought up. So it influenced me a lot, actually. And I got onto the bandwagon and a great fan of Greenpeace. Uh, so when I came to India after that, uh, I had read an article, if I'm not mistaken, about, uh, you know, the unfortunate... Uh, issue of ivory poaching and uh, immediately I wanted to write a song about it. Uh, so though it was written quite some time back and in a different form, uh, it finally came out, uh, I think, in a more powerful way. And uh, I also was fortunate to have a good friend of mine who was uh, running a graphic design company who heard the song, thought about it and understood what to do with the visuals. And I thought that the visuals were amazing. Like it's a, it's a, um, combination of classic art and sand art. So, uh, you know, combined together, uh, it really uh, told a, a very heartbreaking story of, uh, you know, the ivory poaching in general. So I have always been environmentally conscious, still am, and uh, quite 
sad about how things are going right now in terms of the world stage, climate change and all of that. I still do in my own small ways a few things to to try to combat that. But, you know, one person, it, it should be more. It should be more. And I'm sure other people are doing the same. Now, as far as the music is concerned, you see, we can't really dictate uh, what kind of issues musicians would like to sing about. Because, see, in music in general, music is looked at as entertainment. Okay, So there are a lot of bands who do music to entertain the public and there's nothing wrong with that. But there are also groups and like people like myself who would like to be, use music to get across a message whether it's environmental or political, because some of my songs are also quite politically charged, and, you know, about social messages and also about women's issues. Uh, so, in fact, the, the song, Please, from the album, Please, uh, just recently won her voice award on Song You and was uh, telecast on live TV a few days ago. And it has to do with sexual abuse. So, I find that I, I mean, I feel strongly that the music that I write should communicate these messages. So, which is why I mentioned it may not reach the mass because they may not be interested in these things. But I think to me, it's important that I get my concerns across. Whoever it touches, it touches. Whoever it doesn't, it doesn't. But for me, it's important that it's out there. So that's basically how I look at it. So music, technology and chat GPT. Wow, you know, technology has absolutely, undoubtedly revolutionized, you know, the music industry, offering uh, tools that really streamline production, enhance sound quality. I mean, I am a huge fan of technology as to what I can do from sitting inside my house and talking to wonderful people like you, you know, broaden the creative possibilities. So do you believe that musicians can harness technology to push the boundaries of their artistry and create more innovative sounds than what we see? Or is it already happening uh, you know, we'd really like your take on this. This is a bit of a touchy subject because uh, ever since keyboards came into the picture where programming was possible and sampling was possible, a lot of musicians actually lost their jobs. So, especially when it came to the film industry. So, it, it's a touchy subject. Yes, you know, you can create different kind of sounds and all that. And uh, in another way, uh, you don't really need that much of a skill in order to program a song, you know, with this technology. So there also, you know, it's a bit of an iffy, iffy area, I think, because uh, there are musicians with skill who do not know how to use technology, but still create anyway. One example is me. And uh, so I basically just go to the studio and tell the studio engineer, this is what I want, because technology and me just don't mix. I basically compose on the piano and, you know, kind of record voice notes and then create something and then go and get it arranged, sometimes by myself or sometimes by someone else. But yes, it has opened up possibilities for new sounds, new kinds of sounds. And personally, chat GBT, like we had a very interesting experiment in December in association with the Deccan Herald, where uh, uh, I was called up and uh, I garnered in a few of my students and a friend to actually write a song based on a topic. And uh, one of the songs needed to be a chat GPT generated one. Now, it was interesting because 80% of the audience that we had recognized which was the chat GPT song. So maybe as of now, chat GPT does not have the emotional depth needed to create meaningful lyrics. Uh, who knows, it might happen down the line because we don't know where this AI is heading and it's going very fast and we just don't know what the future is going to be like. Uh, so maybe more musicians might use it, I don't know. But I personally feel that if I'm perhaps stuck for lyrics, maybe I might uh, rely on ChatGPT to give me some inspiration, but I will not copy the lyrics because finally, as a musician, when you create, it has to come from it. You know, so... Uh, We'll see how it goes. I, I'm quite the wrong person to ask about technology because I'm, I'm not technologically adequate. <laughs> Thank God, because that's where the authentic uh, sounds and the authentic poetry and the writing that comes from. I'm totally with you in this. Uh, as much as I say that, of course, technology has helped me reboot my career all over again. But as an author and as a writer and as a poet, I, uh, you know, will draw inspiration in the social and the political things that happen around me. 
and uh, but yes uh, you know chat gpt ai is definitely the new reality yes. and uh, there are many authors and writers also who are losing their jobs yes. for the kind of work that they yes. is now possible you know so yes we have a new future coming ahead and i hope by then i'm not alive <laughs> i just tend to think to the students as well as like i don't know what this future world will be like and i hope i'm dead and not that it arrives <laughs> Absolutely, Nisia. Me too. I'm totally with you on that because you know the kind of organic instruments that I have heard. Because I'm I'm a huge fan of music, and I have traveled to the length and breadth of Bengal, and I've heard the Baul musicians, and they create their own instruments there. And you know, it, it's poignantly beautiful. It's breathtaking when you hear them sing songs, you know, of uh, their own uh, written works. So you know what challenges do Western classical piano teachers typically face in terms of receiving adequate recognition and compensation for all the diligent effort? Like you just mentioned in the start, that you know the music industry really is dominated with Hindi music, right? And uh, you know you probably didn't use the word Hindi music, but I'm saying it for you that you know many uh, anything that uh, is. western probably doesn't have a huge appeal that uh, a hindi music uh, you know person who can do uh, hindi film music composition film music actually is the thing so uh, you know how do you um, you know go about you know as far as uh, somebody is going to pursue a career if they want to do in western classical music i mean how do they go about in managing this whole thing uh, the answer is very simple they need to work <laughs> so a lot of my students also and even uh, students from other wonderful teachers that i know if they want to pursue western classical music seriously they have to go abroad for their further education and a lot of them don't come back and i don't blame them because in india obviously the indian classical tradition is very rich and rightly so rightly so uh, and of course i think this is the only country in the world where film music dominates a lot of the musical landscape so western music as such has a very small niche western classical music even small so you know compared to the large landscape of music here western classical music is actually very very tiny but i must say that through the years interest in western classical music has grown but uh, it's unfortunate that we don't have yet a proper conservatory of music here where people can actually take degrees because i guess the market is not ripe enough for it yet which is why a lot of students have to go abroad and it's not cheap to do that because if they especially go to england or to the uk or to australia to pursue their music studies it costs a lot of money and also even for the accommodation and you know, the pocket expenses and all that so it's it's unfortunate unless somebody gets a scholarship from those institutions then even studying western classical music abroad is also not so accessible for everyone so it 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 is an issue yeah so who knows sometime down the line if we get a proper conservatory of music here then that will change a lot of things for a lot of people because believe you me there are a lot of little corners where you find a lot of talented young people but a lot of them you know cannot pursue because of financial issues uh, and all that so it's unfortunate you also have the majorly trust initiative right through your initiative i mean you're providing opportunities for underprivileged children to pursue their musical aspirations so how do you ensure that these initiatives are sustainable and impactful in the long run because maybe kids who want to pursue this will be discouraged at home you know they will not uh, probably be encouraged you know to continue and uh, give the kind of time attention uh, love and passion and all of it because um, i don't think people really understand uh, actually not understand the word would be that you know people especially for underprivileged background people would look at how one can earn so how do you bridge this uh, yeah Asia? so the thing is the majority music trust yes we have this initiative but we've been only able to do this in small ways because unfortunately we do not have any support from the government for what so what we do is uh, we only have very small funds available unfortunately so we would like uh, you know our funds to grow eventually so that we can actually help someone who is underprivileged but who really is passionate about music so that we can help them you know further their studies 
So in, in terms of the outreach program that we've had thus far, we've been able to actually make a choir out of underprivileged children for about a year. So that was quite nice. This was pre-COVID. And we've also gone to orphanages and entertained the kids for a little while. Uh, so, but in terms of big funding to help them to pursue their studies, unfortunately, that's not on the cards because of the fact that we don't have that kind of funding. However, we've been able to give one-on-one -on -one scholarships for a few students through the years to be able to pursue studies with us. And also, we've had a collaboration with the Asavri Music Foundation where at least for summer courses, like they have actually pulled in the money to help the student kind of have at least a short burst of learning, you know, outside for a bit. So it's all it's all baby steps. And I just hope that we can do much, much better. So, Nisya, you have, uh, you know, my deep respect. And, uh, you know, it's such an honor because you are, I think, the only one who's created a pension fund for aged and infirm musicians. And, uh, you know, it's the first of its kind in India. And uh, this is for my listeners. I repeat once again, this is Nisya Majoli, who's the first one in India who's created a pension fund for the aged and infirm musicians. Can you tell us a little bit about this initiative? Yes. So the Majoli Music Trust was set up in 2011 with this purpose, okay? Not only for music education and for the, the you know, bringing Western classical music to the public concerts and, and the workshops and masterclasses, but also this pension fund. So we were fortunately able to set up this pension fund the year after we were uh, founded. Okay? So, uh, and this idea came to me while even before setting up the trust, because there was a newspaper article I read in one of the regional uh, newspapers where there was one very famous Ustad, I forget what his name was, who was living in a miserable one-room flat in Varanasi and no one was helping him and he was dirt poor and I'm like, this is not okay because you see... We are, Bismillah Khan, Ustad Bismillah Khan. Probably, probably. Uh, the Shenai artist. Ah, yes. The yes, person who... Right, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Some yes. of my, uh, uh, I bled yes, when I read uh, that, Nisya. Some of my gray cells, gray, gray cells don't work now you know, getting older, so <laughs> there's some names I don't remember. Yeah. So it, it, it was hard. Really. Yeah, because um, see, India has a lot of wonderful Indian classical musicians who have gone around the world to represent India on the world stage. Yes, but what's what happens to these musicians when their use is over? You know, I'm sorry to say this, but the government doesn't care about them one bit at all. So I was saying this is not okay. You can't just, you know, use them when they are at their prime and then kind of, you know, just forget about them or neglect them when they are no longer, you know, able to present. So I thought this is not okay. Because you see, uh, abroad again, and I know specifically in England, there are, there are many music societies that actually help retired musicians, uh, you know, so that they are not struggling, you know, in their old age. So I was thinking, okay, why don't we start something like this here? I mean, again, it's on a small scale, uh, but at least we can help with a small monthly sum. So to date, we have helped quite a few musicians and we've got uh, some running as well right now. So they are either too old to pursue their art or too ill to pursue their art. So we've been doing this since 2012. So uh, this is one of the things that I'm very proud that the trust is doing because uh, I mean, it's it's needed. It's needed. If no one looks after them, at least we can try. So, Nisi, I'm so tempted to actually have such a marathon long conversation with you about this because I had, a, you know, a very close uh, association as, you know, when I had taken my son to learn peep up jazz in Kolkata with Carlton Quito. And he's no more. And he was uh, also one of, uh, you know, the musicians who decided to not give up that form of jazz that could not be, uh, you know, could not be mixed into the Hindi mainstream cinema. And obviously he led a very, very, uh, you know, he led a life where he used to catch the bus at 70, 75 uh, years of age and go and teach children in, uh, you know, in rich homes. And uh, he also had a fall once from the bus. And, uh, you know, I, I, remember this and I hold this, uh, you know, in a city that uh, I think I love Kolkata and there's so much of uh, respect for the arts and crafts. But here was this man who was having difficulty, uh, you know, in uh, 
leading a life that I think with his kind of, uh, you know, uh, his kind of background and the rich uh, uh, knowledge of music, you know, he stayed in this small, uh, small uh, two room house that went up a whole flight of steps and uh, my God, you know, and, uh, but yes, I mean, that stays on as a, it's a huge gift uh, in my life as one of the experiences of having spent time with him. And so is it today for me to talk to you, Nisia. So, you know, music. Yes. Yeah. You want to say something? Uh, yeah. I wanted to uh, basically like if anyone listening to this podcast and if they know of anyone who needs our help, uh, I would, you know, really request them to reach out to us so that, you know, we can actually uh, help our musicians uh, like we're doing right now. So more. We want to add more to our roster. This year. Thank you. Yeah. Music has the ability to transcend boundaries and bring people together. You know, we don't need a language, actually. Uh, you know, a common language is just music as the language that can help people come together. So do you believe that music can be used as a tool for social change and promoting harmony in today's absolutely polarized world where we're all inhabiting, you know, and we're all getting so, um, you know, caught in our own identities and what is it that we represent? So uh, how can music break this barrier? I think music has always done this uh, from the beginning. So I can uh, recount at least uh, two huge events that happened uh, worldwide. One was something called Live Aid. I think it was in 1984, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so this was the time when there was a terrible famine going on in uh, the east of Africa, you know, Sudan, Ethiopia, and all that. Country. And one of, uh, you know, Britain's uh, bands, they're called Boomtown Rats, and the lead singer, Bob Geldof, you know, he got this idea of, no, we're going to, you know, uh, create a huge event called Live Aid to raise funds uh, so that they could send it to these countries. And it was a huge concert, not only held in the UK, but in other parts of the world as well, via satellite, you know. And all the great bands performed and, you know, it was wonderful. Like they just donated their service free of charge. The stadiums were packed. So all the proceeds, uh, you know, from this live aid concert went towards that. And if I'm not mistaken, there was some other concert like that that also happened. I can't remember the name of it. But, you know, and if I want to talk on a small scale, so even in Bangalore, for example, where I am right now and where I'm based, one thing great about Bangalore is you have an audience for every kind of music. Okay? So uh, even if you know, you, ha you have Western classical music concert where, as I mentioned, the audience is very small. But however, you find in Bangalore people who are curious to know what this music is about. You know, so you might find some unfamiliar faces. It's like, uh, you know, they'll come, they'll sit, they'll listen, and they have an open mind about what they're listening to. And then they find that they really like it. And then they want to come and attend other concerts as well. So somewhere, somehow, the music touches a person in on many different levels. It could be a huge event, it could be a small event, but it's somewhere where people just come together just to enjoy what the music gives to them. No matter from what background you might be, or you know, for a lot of people, it doesn't matter what what music is it, it is, but somehow you know it has a kind of a an intangible power to just kind of bring people together and just touch them in various ways that possibly nothing else can. But this is what the arts does. And, you know, this is also one one little grouse of mine that, you know, schools need to pay much more attention to arts education, uh, you know, with children from the very beginning. Uh, because it does develop a much more wholesome attitude to life, uh, you know, and gives them different kind of skills than just focusing on academics. So, I mean, I completely agree with you on that. So that, you know, we have uh, pretty much more well-balanced individuals. <laughs> so, Nisia, if you were to look back at the young Nisia when she was pre-teens, uh, you know, so what uh, do you think, uh, you know, you would like to offer advice to yourself when you're younger? Because many of our listeners listening to you now would were inspired to take on music as a career, you know, would learn from you. Uh, so what would you, you know, if you were to look back, what are the lessons that you've learned? What is it that you would have done differently? Um, I think possibly nothing at all because um, 
see my my late father uh, was very particular that he wanted a girl and he wanted a girl to be a musician so fortunately for him he got both and uh, possibly i was born with talent as well because when i was just 10 days old and brought back from the hospital he inundated me with western classical music 24 hours a day so maybe that's one of the reasons why it kind of seeped in and at the age of 2 and a half he actually started me on the piano obviously by rote because i couldn't read anything and uh, by age 4 i was able to finish like all the lessons in the first method book so i couldn't actually read it and uh, it just went on from there possibly the advice i would give myself would not be in the pre teens but when i was actually doing my music deeper um most would probably be to enjoy myself more when i was playing rather than being too anxious about trying to get everything right i think that was that would be one of the things that i would have told myself <laughs> how lovely is that so who's your favorite music composer and why Okay, so it's changed over the years. So initially, it was uh, Claude Debussy, who is a French composer at the turn of the twentieth century, uh, and then it changed to Beethoven after some time because uh, I find that Beethoven's temperament and mine kind of matched a little bit in many many ways. But now I will say that there's no particular favorite now because a lot of them have have different things uh, in terms of your their compositional techniques and all that because when prior concert pianist why i'm some semi retired is because of some health issues so i'm not able to practice as long as i should so i can't say that you know i'm a concert pianist now because that requires several hours of practice which i'm not able to do nowadays but uh, you know when you study the music of different composers you see different beauties from each one of them uh, though i will say that beethoven is kind of one of my firm, firm favorites My favorite is Ludovico Giannardi and I keep listening to you know some of his compositions and they are like absolutely they they are very very transcendent and uh, I mean I'm a huge fan myself of western classical music so Nisia can I just request you today for World Piano Day would you just play a small little piece for us with a beautiful piano that I can see right next to you yeah So what I'm going to do is because I'm not aware of how much time you need for the piece so I'm just going to make it short so I'm just going to play the last section of something so here again uh, this is actually a beautiful uh, piece by uh, Fanny Hensel now just a little background Fanny Hensel is actually the sister of Felix Mendelssohn who is of course one of the most famous early romantic era composers and uh, the thing is Fanny herself composed a lot of music but you know the era at that time never took women seriously if they actually wrote or published anything under their name so fanny had to publish her own works under the name of her brother so that it could be put out there but now we know through research that this is actually her music so i think you should understand by now that i'm quite a feminist already So <laughs> that's why we're talking to each other Nisia. <laughs> so so in fact uh, for the past couple of years I've been championing more of women's compositions. So in fact I've I've had a choir also uh, named Fem Musica where we perform music only by women composers, choral music and solo music by women composers. And I've also been playing music by women composers. So this is just the last part of one of her pieces which is entitled Melo please such an honor thank you so much nisia so just a small small slip of it
Beautiful. Just a small stick. <laughs> Beautiful. I was so transported. Thank you so much, Nisia, for being on today's podcast. It's been an absolute honor. Wish you lots and lots of luck and many, many more compositions and music. And uh, thank you so much for being on today's podcast. Thank you. Thank you. To you, our dearest listeners, you can find us on your favorite streaming services, Spotify, Amazon Music, Apple Podcast, and of course, on all other major streaming services. With loads of love, we are The Mohua Show, where we talk imandari se.